Well, it is good to see you. I'll echo what Brother Hornaday said. We're glad to have you, glad to have those visiting with us. It's a great compliment to the church here that folks would drive uh, to be with this congregation and to uh, support the efforts here. And I'm very excited and thankful to be with you. Uh, it's uh, a blessing uh, that I don't take lightly. We did begin a study this morning of uh, wisdom literature. Just a reminder, a few lessons from this portion of Scripture that I think is so badly needed in a world that seems to have lost its mind. And that Christians, old and young, wise and unwise, can profit and benefit from being reminded of the inspired wisdom teaching. And we've spent most of today looking at the book of Proverbs. Uh, and uh, we do plan tomorrow night, Lord willing, to begin some lessons from the book of Job. And then at the end of the week to uh, spend a couple of lessons on Ecclesiastes. Uh, so, but <clears throat> in looking at Proverbs, I've, I've shaped the lesson tonight. Uh, Proverbs as, as a distinguisher between wisdom and folly. And I, I call this lesson, How to Spot a Fool. That seems a bit provocative and maybe even insulting. I don't mean it to be. Uh, somebody one time saw that title and asked me, said, well, you got anybody in mind? <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got somebody in mind. And it was me. I... I say with all sincerity, I, I, every time I read through the Proverbs, every time I think about this section of Scripture, it makes me feel mighty small, and it should, because i got a lot to clean up. And one thing I know, if I'm reading from this section of Scripture, and I'm thinking about all the folks that I know that need this lesson, I'm missing the point, because this isn't about all the folks that need this lesson, it's about me. So with that idea in mind, I want to think with you a minute about some of the distinguishing characteristics. That's what Proverbs is, isn't it? It's that great work that shows us the difference. And the difference comes down to choices, you know. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 6, forsake foolishness and live, go in the way of understanding. It's all about choices. You forsake this road, you go down this road. What makes a wise man? Well, one thing we know it's not how much formal education he has because there are some mighty wise people who didn't go very far in uh, schooling and there are a lot of foolish people who um, used to be an old political writer. He died a few years ago. But he used to like to say that he would rather be governed by the first 300 people in the Boston phone book than he would the faculty of Harvard University. That was one of his favorite sayings. You know, I sort of agree with that. There are a lot of folks who are very bright. They've got high IQs. And maybe they have great accomplishment in terms of education. They're not wise people. So wisdom is not about those things. Wisdom is about, as we tried to say this morning in the lesson, what is really wisdom? Wisdom is how close we get to the will of God. And when we get our will in line with the will of God, then that's what wisdom really is about. So let's think a minute about some of those areas that the Proverbs make so clear. It's distinguishing marks between wisdom and folly. And if you just read through the Proverbs, one thing that you see point made over and over again, one area that is held up to us and to our attention over and again uh, has to do with our speech. You can tell a wise man from a fool by how he speaks. For example, in Proverbs chapter 15, in verse 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. That expression, useth aright, that, that verb to use is, is found in other places in the Old Testament in reference to playing a musical instrument. I can't play a musical instrument. Uh, I can admire people that do. I don't have that ability. I can't uh, play the pot and the spoon, as the fellow said. But, but when you see someone who can sit down and play it, a piano, uh, it takes skill, talent, it takes a lot of practice, it takes devotion, and there are people who can do that. Uh, 
I've heard people do that and do it very well. I've also heard people, uh, well, they sound a little bit like uh, a cat running across the keys, you know. There's a big difference in a cat running across the keys and somebody who knows how to play the piano. There's a big difference between someone who is uh, a marksman. Again, I, this is not a political statement, and, and maybe it's uh, out of place with some of the recent things going on, but then again, maybe it is appropriate. Um, you know, I've never been a big gun guy. My, my dad was not a hunter. He hunted when he was a kid. We didn't hunt when I was growing up. But the environment I was in, a lot of my neighbors, they certainly did. It was a rite of passage to my best friend across the street. Um, you know, he had three sons, and as they got a certain age, they got a 410 shotgun. But before they got their 410 shotgun so they could go out and hunt, uh, they got a super education about gun safety and how to handle it and how to aim it and what to do and what not to do. And those folks were careful with the way they handled things. There's a lot of difference in, in handing someone like that a, a pistol, for example. And then just going to the zoo and taking a loaded pistol and throwing it over in the monkey cage. Let's see what happens. There's a great deal of difference in that. Here's the difference. Skill, purpose, thought, restraint. Now, there are two people here. One of them uses knowledge aright. He has that tongue that reflects that kind of skillful use. And I would suggest to you that uh, the Bible would teach that our speech is no less dangerous than a loaded gun. Isn't that what James talked about? The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It's, uh, it can do so much damage. And the point that James makes there is that you've got to be extremely careful and wise about how you use the tongue because it, will, it can destroy it sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. That's what he said. You believe that? I don't mean that insultingly, but I mean, do we think about it that way? How many people do you think in the world at large, in the community outside of this room, got up this morning and thought, well, I've got to be extra careful with my speech today. This is a loaded gun. I need to be... I, I fear so many people would be like uh, some sort of a primate with a loaded weapon. That's how their speech is. They, they don't have that kind of discernment. The wise man said, some people use their tongue with the skill of a musician using an instrument. And then some people, he said, they just, the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. I'm told by people that know more than I do that the, the verb there, pour out, could easily be translated belch out. It could even be more crudely vomit out. That's an ugly picture, but that's exactly the idea. The crudeness of some speech versus the skill of others. You want to know the wise man from the fool? The wise man understands the power of speech. And he uses speech with the skill that a musician uses an instrument. There's a big difference between being skillful and just running on at the mouth when words are lacking, or words are many, I should say, transgression is not lacking. But whoso restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The mind of the wicked is of little worth. Now that's an obvious point, but it is important to remember that. Why is it that uh, silver is more valuable than gravel? Obviously, because there's a whole lot more gravel. And he says that words that are too plentiful become worthless. And so he warns me here to be careful that when words are many, transgression is not lacking. In other words, the more I talk, the more likely I am to say something I should not say, to do damage with my speech, to make my speech less impactful, meaningless at best. You have people who uh, will, will uh, just sort of brag about the idea. They'll say, oh man, uh, you know, I know I talk too much. Well, when I'm in that kind of situation, what I'm really saying is, 
Boy, I'm really foolish with my mouth. And I'm acting the part of a fool. It's important for me to recognize that I'm the one who has to edit my speech and I need to do that with the idea in mind of not acting foolishly. There's a passage in 1528. The mind of the righteous ponders or studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked just pours out foolish things. I like that term study. I used to joke that uh, the fellows who were working on the King James Version must have been from Mississippi because they talk so much like Southerners. I think it might be the other way around. But uh, you ever heard that old expression? Some of you maybe have. Uh, I'm going to study about that. Or let me study about that. Well, that's a great concept. What it says is that before I give you an answer, I'm going to have to think about this from every angle, and I'll get back with you on it. That's what we need. People who will ponder before they answer. I've told some of you already about this. Um, and I, I would appreciate you remembering me in prayer. I, I've been appointed here a couple of months ago, myself and another man, to be one of the shepherds at uh, the congregation where we attend. And, um, and I, I, we told the church at the time, I said, here we are, two guys, never been elders, uh, over a congregation, never had elders. So get ready for a learning curve. But uh, they, they treated us very well, and Donald and I are trying our best to walk appropriately and rightly. I would appreciate your prayers on our behalf, and I mean that sincerely. I appreciate Brother Rader's prayer tonight for me. I need it. But as our work as shepherds, but one of the things that I, I do know though I don't know much, I do know this, that we've got to work as a team, whether there's two of us or four of us or however many there are. And one of the things that I'm trying to learn is that I don't really need to have an opinion anymore about things. Uh, you know, people come up to you, and w with all good intentions, and they'll say, this is a problem, what are you going to do about this? Uh, if I am thinking properly, what I ought to say is, let me make sure I understand what you're concerned about. You're concerned about this and this. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to go talk with the elder or the other elders, as the case might be. And I will, and we'll consider this matter, and we'll get back with you about an answer. I don't need to be over here shooting off about what I think. And we haven't talked together. And then I'm given one answer, and then when we get together, it may be something else. That's just not, not the way it ought to be. There's a, there's a special place for carefulness here. But all of us need to be careful before we answer a matter. To ponder, as opposed to just letting our first thought, what's the old saying, whatever. With some people, whatever comes up, comes out. You ever heard that? Don't let that be the case. 1813 speaks to that same point. He that answereth the matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame to him. Uh, I said this morning that I found it to be needful in my life to try to start every morning by putting in the form of a prayer the statement in James, Lord, today help me to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I wish I could stand here and tell you that I have never been guilty of violating what this passage is talking about. Sometimes we're so full of words and we know we already got the answer. We, don't, we haven't even heard the question. We haven't even given the courtesy of hearing what the question is. We assume we know and we assume. And then later on we're ashamed because we did not have the humility and the patience to think before we spoke. He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame to him. That's exactly right. Sometimes the Proverbs are funny, aren't they? I mean, they, there is a sense of humor in the Proverbs, though these things are all deadly serious. One of those passages is 2617, which uh, in the modern speech translation reads something like this, he who meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. It's interesting 
If you look back in the old King James translation, uh, it reads a little bit differently. The picture's a little bit differently. Different. Uh, he that passeth by and meddleth with strife not belonging to him is like one that takes a dog by the ears. It seems that the translators are not quite certain who's doing the passing, whether it's the dog or the man, but the, but the point is not hard to understand. And it does bring up a rather ridiculous position. Here's a, here's a fellow, maybe a friend of yours, and you see him, and he's all scarred up, and his clothes are torn, he's bleeding over here, and he's got some wounds, and you say, what in the world happened to you? He said, well, I, I don't know, really, I... I, I, I was just uh, walking down the road and I saw a strange dog. And so I just went over to him and grabbed him by the ears and jerked like that. And you know that thing bit me? <laughs> no. Really? What did you, ex what were you thinking? Uh, Proverbs says to Wesley, you need to really consider how far to enter into somebody else's affairs. <laughs> that you do not have to have an opinion about everything in the world. You don't know everything, and you don't even know what's going on over here. And so wisdom would teach you that you need to restrain your urge to insert yourself in some situations. There's a passage over in... 1 Peter chapter 4, we didn't put it on the chart, but it's a, it certainly comes to mind. Maybe you're thinking of this same verse. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15. And Peter there, you know, 1 Peter has a lot to say about suffering and about enduring and faith through suffering. And uh, Peter makes the point here in chapter 4 that there's some type of suffering that you ought not be ashamed of. Any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. But there's some suffering that is shameful. Uh, that's where he tells us, um, uh, if any, let none of you suffer, he says, as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. That's clear enough. And then he says, or, the old King James says, or as a busybody in other men's matters. That, that expression there comes from one word, and it's a humdinger of a word. Now, I've already told you, I don't know much about Greek, but I do love the words, and sometimes the, the pictures they give are great. I appreciate what one brother, friend of mine said in his preaching. He said, I don't bring up these words unless there's something familiar about them and a point to make there. And I think that's a pretty good philosophy. And, and, and the word that's found here is allotrio episcopois. Wow. And that doesn't sound very familiar, but a little bit familiar. Allos is one of the words in the language they tell me. There are a couple of words for another. And they're ex different, but that's the idea. Here's something that's different, maybe different of a same kind. Allos. And then you have this word episcopos. Now, that sounds familiar. We know what that word's about. In the, in the King James, it's translated bishop. Most of the translations, overseer, epi, scopos to see over, to superintend. And so you put those words together and it's a really interesting picture, isn't it? Here's a fellow who's trying to oversee something that's not his, that doesn't belong to him. And Peter says that uh, if you do that and you suffer, and you will just as surely as you'll suffer if you grab a passing dog by the ears, there's no glory for you in that. Um, now, I think it's important for us maybe to make a quick distinction here. You know, there are times when we might insert ourselves in a situation, and I think do so rightly. Do you think um, that uh, in Acts 8, when Philip went down there and uh, uh, ran up to the chariot and asked uh, the eunuch whether he understood what he was reading, do you think he was being a busybody? I don't, and you don't either. Well, he was obeying the Holy Spirit for one thing. But even if you don't have the direct instruction of the Holy Spirit, I'd be shocked if there are not plenty of folks in here in this room that have done this very thing. You might be at a restaurant, and you'll notice over here, here's a fella, or maybe a lady. Let's just say here's a fella, and he's reading his Bible. You don't know him, you've not met him. And you might go over to him, and you might say, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that's a really good book you got there. 
And you'll sort of see what his reaction is. And then you might say to him something like, uh, understandest thou what thou readest? See, if you get a reaction out of him, maybe, maybe he'll recognize that. Maybe he'll say, nope, okay. Or maybe he'll say, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Sometimes I, and so you'll have a conversation with him, and next thing you know, you'll sit down, or maybe you'll, I, I, I know you guys, I haven't seen them around here. You've got a card that the church has printed here, somebody has. And if, if time doesn't allow, or if, if he doesn't have time, you'll say, look, here's my number, and you, I love to read the Bible with folks. If you'd call me, yeah, would that be in a busybody? I don't think so. We're just trying to share the gospel. It might be that your neighbor, somebody you know, they're in a lawful marriage, as far as you know, and then they're talking about splitting up. And they come tell you about that. Would you be out of place in telling them, you know, the Lord loves marriage and doesn't love divorce? I wish, I wish I could maybe read with you some verses and just... There may be times, my point is, when we do insert ourselves, when we answer a question, we understand that. But this is, this is not that. That's not what Peter's talking about, is it? Peter's talking about something that comes out of hubris and arrogance and thoughtlessness and somebody trying to answer matters and direct people and they don't even know what's going on. Some of the modern translations of, of 1 Peter 4 we were looking at read, someone who is over-interested over in another's matters. Uh, the ASV says a meddler. <laughs> uh, one says trying to control other people's lives. Another says self-appointed overseer in other men's matters. What the Proverbs would say is that that's the mark of a fool. He's the kind of guy that, uh, you know, it was said sometimes that uh, we ought to try to meet every question with an open mind. One fellow was described this way. He said his problem is he meets every question with an open mouth. You know, he knows everything and he's going to tell you about it. I don't have to have an opinion about everything. In fact, another thing I think is a little bit funny, but it makes a very serious point. Is 1728, where he says, even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. And uh, he that shuts his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. And the wise man seems to be saying to you, you know, Wesley, if you just be quiet, they might mistake you for a wise man. At least they wouldn't find out you were a fool so quick. So just be quiet. Well, I'm sure you've probably heard some good lessons through the years about how that silence can be sinful. And that's right. That's exactly right. And I look back on my life and I can see some times when maybe I was silent and I should not have been. But I think for myself, I can look back on a lot more times when I wasn't silent and should have been. And in those cases, I was a fool. Because that's what defines a fool, is foolish behavior. I don't know if you follow sports. I imagine a lot of you do. I don't know as much as I used to. But there was an old coach that in the pros one time, and somebody asked him about his team, and they had started off very badly. Maybe they were one in five or something like that. And somebody was saying to him, you've got such a talented roster, this team is better than its record. And his answer to the reporter was, you know, you are what your record says you are. You can say we're a great team. If we're one in five, that's what we are. Well, in a much more serious way, I'll tell you, if I act foolishly, that's what I am. And you say, oh, I'm not a fool. But when I act foolishly, that's what I am. So there's a lot said about that subject. Let's just move on quickly and talk about a couple more. Another area where the, uh, the Proverbs uh, define or distinguish between wisdom and folly has to do with how they handle money. You can tell a wise man from a fool by how he handles money. And there are two extremes, aren't there, in the Proverbs. One of them is in the realm of covetousness. Covetousness. Uh, several years ago, there was a guy named Brackeen or Brackert. And uh, I, I ran across these. They were probably printed many years before I was born. But they're illustrations this guy came up with of the Ten Commandments. 
And the one that stuck out with me, and I'll even share it with you if you'll let me, is this one. This is his representation of thou shalt not covet. I think this illustration really is a pretty good explanation of exactly what covetousness is. Here you have the guy over here, and uh, he's in the sunlight. And uh, he's got an adoring wife there who's just grinning at him, you know, and the, this, this daughter looking up to him with great admiration. I admit the chicken doesn't look much, but anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, cooked with love. But, you know, all he can think about is the guy up on the hill in the big house. But does that guy look happy to you? Oh, he's in a dinner jacket, and he's, uh, he's got silverware and crystal and all the rest of it. But he doesn't look happy to me. And the fellow who's serving him doesn't look like uh, he thinks of him anything but a paycheck. And the whole point of it is, just how absurd is it that this man doesn't realize that he's the most blessed man? He can't see any of his blessings because he's so concerned about what, wanting some, what somebody else has. And that point is made in the Proverbs several times. There are people who think that financial success is success. Proverbs 15 and verse 16, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. The old idea that uh, if, uh, if you got something, you're somebody, and if you ain't got nothing, you ain't nobody. People who judge others and judge themselves by how much they have, how big their car is, that has to be some of it, doesn't it? When you see people who come into money, maybe athletes or other, you know, entertainers, whoever it is, that just have this fabulous wealth dumped on them, and the first thing they do is they run out and they buy a 25-room mansion. And they're single. And you think, how many beds can you sleep in? I've got 28 cars in my garage. How many can you drive at a time? Why do they do that? Well, because they think that's what big people do and that's where their self-esteem comes from. Anyway, it's just so foolish. The fear of the Lord with little is much better than all the money that ever has been. 22 and verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. If you want to be blessed then live in such a way as to, to have the admiration of a good woman or a good man. Live in such a way that your children will rise up and call you blessed. You can't do better than that. No matter how much you got or how little you got or how big or little your house is, all that really is a sign. That's what counts, he says. And if you don't realize that, then that's That's folly. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord's the maker of them all. And ultimately, he'll be the judge of them all too, won't he? Uh, you know, the, the fool believes in financial security. Uh, that's what he thinks of. Uh, that uh, somehow, if I have enough in the bank, I'll be secure. The wise man just tears that idea apart. I think it's Solomon who tears that apart. Do not wear yourself out getting rich. Be smart enough to stop when you only catch a fleeting glimpse of wealth before it's gone. It makes wings like an eagle and flies into the sky. How many people have come to realize that bitter lesson that the money that they counted on somehow just flies away and suddenly they're left with an empty bag? Proverbs 11 and verse 28, whoever trusts in riches will fall. If you trust in something like riches, you're trusting in what's not trustable. So there's covetousness on the one hand, but the other extreme is carelessness. And the Proverbs likewise warn us against that spirit as well. That's also foolish behavior. Look in 27 and verse 23 with me just a moment. Proverbs 27 and verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds for riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. The hay appears, and the tender grass shows itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, 
and for the food of thy household, and for thy, the maintenance of thy maidens. I got a buddy of mine who years ago began his own business. And uh, as he opened his small business, uh, somebody told him a story that stuck with him and he shared it with me. And I'll, I'll give you an abbreviated version of it. Maybe you've heard this illustration. But it went something like this. There were two guys who owned farms, big farms, right beside each other. And one day, man goes to his friend and he says, uh, you want to buy me out because I'm sinking. I've, I've got very little time here. I may be... Uh, well, he didn't want to buy his friend that. He wanted to help his friend. And he thought he could. So he goes back in the back and he comes back out to his friend and he brings him a little wooden box about yay big. And he said, this is what you need. And here's what I want you to do. Listen to me, he said. I want you personally to take this box and I want you to go over your entire operation with this box. Don't open the box. Just carry it with you over your entire operation in the next few months, every part of it. And I believe it'll change your life. Well, you know, the story goes. First day, he feels sort of stupid. He's got his box, but he goes out to this park. He hasn't been out there in I don't know how long. And he sees the fences are down. He'd been losing animals, and he couldn't figure it out, so... There's supposed to be somebody in charge of that. Wound up firing that guy, getting the fences fixed. Another day he's got his box, you know, and he's over here in an area where they, they kept stores and there should have been maybe six weeks worth of stores in this particular uh, place and there were about six days worth and somebody had been stealing from him and got that guy fired, got some, And then you get the point. He goes over. So after a while he comes back to his friend at the end of the year and he says, I know you just lent me this box for a year, but he said, I'd like to keep it. I said, these things are better than they've been in a long time. And his friend said, uh, I don't care what you do with the box. You can keep it or whatever. Did you open it? He said, no, I didn't open it. You told me not to. Why don't you open the box? Open the box. Inside the box, a little piece of paper. On the paper, four words written. Four words were, tend to your business. That's it. No magic in the box. His friend could see what he couldn't see. He had spent years depending on other people and not really minding the story. What does Solomon say here? Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and your herds. This is your money. This is what will keep you, but it won't do it automatically. And that's a great principle about the things that God gives us. And my friend said he'd remember that lesson all through the years as he tried to run his business. Keep up with what's going on. You don't have to do it all, but you need to know what's happening. That's a good rule for elders, I guess, isn't it? Maybe I'm trying to learn that lesson. But it's a good rule for all of us. Whatever we have, whatever we're given. There's another great lesson about this in the Proverbs, and it's over in chapter 22. Let's just go over there uh, as we're running out of time. But uh, there are a couple of lessons here on the subject of debt. Um, this is uh, in middle Tennessee I guess most people have heard uh, who's the guy Dave Ramsey talk you know I'm not here giving a Ramsey lecture I have heard him refer to this passage before and it is in the Bible uh, this is where the wise man says verse 7 that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant of the lender there is a certain servitude that comes with borrowing money I don't believe the Bible teaches it's, it's sinful to borrow money but I will say what I hope we all would agree with, and that is that you can make a mess of things if you're irresponsible with debt. My generation was terrible at that. And I think that uh, those who came after me a couple of generations, likewise, made a mess of it. Easy credit. Uh, you'd go to the college campus, and you'd see out there, uh, uh, maybe on a game day or something like that, he'd be some little booth and uh, sign up. The students, sign up for a MasterCard. You get a free umbrella. You can't believe how expensive that umbrella is going to be. Because they're going to sign up for this card, and they're going to just swipe, 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 and all of a sudden the bill comes in. They can't pay it. Carry it over the next time. Compound interest at 40% or whatever it was, 30%. 
What a mess they've made. It wasn't just kids doing that. Easy to borrow, hard to get out of. It's slavery. And so, you know, but the Proverbs 3,000 years ago said, don't overextend yourself. Later on in the same chapter, he, he talks about how, verse 26, be not one of them that strike hands or that are sureties for debts. For if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take thy bed from under thee? I don't think he's saying that is wrong to cosign. But he's saying when you promise something that you can't deliver on, if you make a promise, you have to assume you're going you're gonna, to, the worst, you have to assume that's going to happen. And I've got to be able to handle that. But I can't handle that. I just gave my word. And so what happens when they take my bed away? Well, I'll tell you one thing I'll think of. I'm a, I've been a fool. And I've made a, a, a mess of things. Uh, Proverbs 21 and verse 20 reads, There is treasure to be desired, and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spends it up. When I read that verse, I think about my father's, mother's generation. I was, came along a little late in life. My dad was born in 1922. Uh, a few weeks ago, if he'd lived, he'd have been 100 years old, May 21st. Uh, he didn't make anywhere near that. He died at 60. But uh, My mother was born in 24. That generation went through the Great Depression as kids. They went through the Second World War. They faced a lot of hardships. My mother, her father died uh, in the early uh, years before there was Social Security, left nine kids, you're going to have to find a way to make it. And those folks somehow did. They could take a little, and they could, it would meet their needs, and they have a little left over. That's what wise people would do. They, they knew how to take what was given to them and make it work. And my generation came along and thought we needed everything all at once, and I'm afraid generations since have struggled with that. But wise people know they don't have to spend every dollar that they make. And wise people are uh, aware and leery of the too good to be true. That's 2819, I think, if I understand it. Where the wise man wrote, He that tills his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that follows after vain persons shall have poverty enough. You might notice if you're following along in the King James Version, I don't know if anybody is, that the word persons there is in italics. Uh, it's supplied by the translator. Other translations read a little differently. Uh, those who are following vain pursuits. One translation puts it rather loosely, those who chase fantasies. He says, better to work for what you get than to follow what seems to be too good to be true. A quick story. There's a brother I knew, good guy. Uh, I went to visit him one day, and uh, in his living room there, fireplace had a mantle, and on the mantle there was a little bottle of black liquid about that big. And so I noticed it, and I asked him, You mind me asking, what is that bottle? He said, Oh, that's crude oil. I said, okay. I said, Well, you mind me asking why you got a bottle of crude oil on your mantle? He said, No, I don't mind. He told me this story, and I, I'll just, just skim it. But the bottom line is that one day, somebody he knew and trusted called him up and said, Hey, we have found out about this terrific deal. They uh, have found oil out west somewhere, and we're gathering investors, and uh, you're going to triple your money in six months. This is the greatest thing. If you've got some money, get it out, put it in this thing. And, uh, and so he did. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a reckless man, but he, again, he thought he was standing on solid ground, and he wasn't. And the bottom line was, everybody who put in everything, I think, lost everything. And I think there were folks who wound up going to jail over it. I don't know. It was a very sad, sad story. But anyway, um, so when that happened, of course, his wife wanted to take that bottle and throw it as far as she could in the woods in the back of the house. But he said, no, no, let's just leave it there. Maybe we can get some good out of that yet. And he told me, he said, I have 
Because since that time, when somebody calls me up on the phone and says, hey, have I got a deal for you? He said, I just look at that little bottle of crude oil and I say, no, thank you. And I hang up just that smoothly. He said, there's nothing to it. That thing has saved me some money. Well, I, I think the point to be made there is I'm not against investment. And folks know a lot more about that than I do. But the bottom line is, if we go into life expecting to get what we earn and not something that's too easy, again, the old saying is what is too good to be true or seems too good to be true almost always is. And the wise man would save us from that. Let me mention to you, you can tell a wise man from a fool by his temperament as well. 1417, a man of quick temper acts foolishly, but a man of discretion is patient. You hardly ever read about a wise man with a quick temper, do you? They don't really come in that variety. That's like saying a square circle. They just, they're just incompatible. Quick temper is the characteristic of a fool. He that is slow to wrath is a great understanding, but he that is hasty exalts folly, lifts it up for all to see. The fool gives full vent to his anger. But the wise man quietly holds it back. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Well, you might as well just say it as think it. No, 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 no. You ought not think it. You certainly ought not say it. But, but a fool will just give full vent. Just let his anger have the drivers, have the wheel, you know, and just drive into the ditch. Um, keeping away from strife is an honor for a man. But any fool will quarrel. It doesn't take a genius or a wise man. To quarrel. I think the key to the matter is to stop it where it starts. 1714 reads, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. We all understand the illustration. You can take water and it's not hard to pour it on the ground, it's just awfully hard to get it back into the bottle. So the best thing is don't pour it out. Stop before it starts. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word will stir up strife. And if it is started, by all means, stop it. Stop it where you are. Don't just continue. Proverbs 30 and verse 32, If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thy hand upon thy mouth, for, he says, surely, the churning of milk brings forth butter, and the wringing of the nose brings forth blood, and the forcing of wrath brings forth strife. I'm sure at some point you've heard it explained that actually these three words in our translation are the same in the original uh, language, churning, wringing, forcing. And the idea is don't just keep on. You suppose there are ever times maybe when a husband is arguing with his wife and he comes to realize during the argument that he's wrong, but just for pride's sake he keeps on arguing? That's a really foolish thing to do, isn't it? Um, somebody said that you can usually tell when two people are arguing. He said there are two sides. He said there's the right side and the side that's doing all the talking. I think there's a lot of truth in that. And the wise man would say, stop. Don't make things worse. Uh, that's the real strength, by the way. 1632 talks about how that a man that can rule his spirit is greater than a conqueror. A man that takes a city. The greatest fight we'll ever have is that fight within to fight foolishness and to be wise. You can tell a wise man from a fool by his family relationships. It's a powerful verse in 14.1. Every wise woman builds her house, but the foolish plucks it down with her hands. That's a very powerful graphic picture. They're very strong words that are used there. Like the destruction of a city. It brings up an absurd picture. If you saw your neighbor... Maybe uh, the lady that lives beside you. And uh, every morning she was out there in the house she lived in. I'm not talking about demolition property. And she had a, a, maybe a sledgehammer and she was knocking bricks out of the wall. He said, what are you doing? 
you cut a hole in the side of your house there. I don't, I don't know. I just, I just can't help myself. Well, that woman needs some help. But we're not talking about the physical structure here, are we? We're talking about the family. And there are women and there are men who every day are just taking a hammer to their family to destroy it. When you look in the Scriptures, uh, when the Bible talks about women destroying their house, it, it, it a lot of times comes back to something like 2119. It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. When I read this, I always think about a friend of mine, young man, good guy. He was rather nervous, and he was reading the Scripture one day, and he came to this passage, and he misread it, you know, out of nervousness. And he read that it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a conscious woman, <laughs> which is not fair. Uh, a little strong. But a contentious woman. You know, it's no bargain to live with somebody that's contentious. You want to tear your house down? I tell you what, just be contentious every day. Just be ready to fight every day, be angry all the time. That's a great way to do it. Now, I think there's some people who have problems that maybe need a medical uh, answer. Maybe they just have some kind of imbalance or whatever. But when it comes down to my choice, I need to choose to find a way to fix this problem, whatever way. Um, 12, 4, 4 goes with this also. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But she that makes a shame is as rottenness in his bones. Shameful behavior, contentious behavior. Again, it, it, the humor of the Proverbs, but it's deadly serious. 11.22, a jewel and a pig stout, so he says, is a fair woman without discretion. Without discretion. Wish we had more time to talk about that fact. I had a, uh, a relative of mine, he wasn't a Christian. And one time, years ago, he was talking about this, this girlfriend of his, and he was thinking about marrying her. And he told me, I didn't know her, but he said, she's got, a, she's got such a cute temper. Oh, boy. I, I knew this. I said, son, you marry that temper. It won't be cute anymore. I promise you that. I don't care how pretty she is. You know, if, if, if she's not uh, pretty on the inside, you're going to have a lot of trouble. So there are ways in which women tear down their house. Men also destroy their house. So oftentimes in the Proverbs, that comes back, if you'll notice, to disloyalty. As in 9, 13, Here's a man so foolish that he believes the old harlot's line about stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Try to make treachery and adultery look like something that's good. How foolish do we have to be to believe that? In chapter 5, isn't it interesting, isn't it powerful? When you read this chapter, and I know you have through the years, the wise man talks about this woman whose lips are like a honeycomb, but she is poisonous and she's trying to kill you. Remove thy way far from her, lest, he says, you give your years to the cruel and strangers be filled with your wealth. How many folks in, in I start to say America, I wonder how many people in this county, I wonder how many people in this state how many guys are trying to pay for two or three households because of their sexual behavior? They owe this woman and they owe this woman and they owe this woman. Ain't nothing new about that. And he says there, you mourn at the last, verse 11, when your flesh and your body are consumed. Nothing new about venereal disease. And sexual promiscuity brings physical destruction. There's nothing new about that. It's always been the result of folly. That's why he says uh, you need to drink water out of your own cistern. Or in chapter 6, another passage that deserves more attention than we'll give it, but here's this adulteress who just takes in this foolish, naive young man and makes a fool of him. He's like a, he's like a, a the uh, the cow going down to the slaughterhouse. He doesn't know it's his last trip. He's just uh, used to, to following along, and so that's what he does. And all the destruction that comes with it. 
You know, it's not just the husband or the wife, the parents likewise can destroy their family by, by failing to punish and to discipline their children. We remember Proverbs 29, 19, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Correct thy son while there is hope. He'll give you rest. He shall delight your soul. The Proverbs have a great deal to say about the importance of, of disciplining your children responsibly, consistently, and yet all my life, you know, we've lived with the wisdom of this world that says it's awful to punish your children. They still say that. I can remember as a young man, before I had children, before I was married, sitting in an audience like this and uh, listening to Irvin Lee talk about the home. That's pretty great. And Brother Lee, uh, he'd, he'd talk about discipline and about how there were some folks who just thought it was awful that you might spank your children. And I remember one time he got up there with, by the podium like this, he raised his knee and he went, and every eye was on him then. And he said, you know, that didn't do any permanent damage to my leg, stung a little bit. Do you really think that that's going to kill your child if you put that on their backside? He said, it might really help them to realize there's just some things that are just not worth doing. And I thought that was a great point. But, you know, the proverb said it before. Don't tear down your house by failing to teach your children what the word no means. Because until we do that, they're just going to be vulnerable in all kinds of ways. Hold not correction from the child. If you beat him with a rod, he shall not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Finally, and I appreciate your patience. One other way in which I think wisdom and folly are distinguished in the Proverbs has to do with how people value the spiritual and the eternal. There is that expression we talked about or mentioned the other day, maybe this morning, I'm sorry. Had to be this morning, what? I just got here. Um, about the fear of the Lord. It's used over and over again. Uh, and, and what the fear of the Lord comes back to is that spiritual outlook that sees everything in, within the reverence of God, the spiritual outlook that a man develops out of his respect for God, godliness we might call it. I think the last time that expression is used in the Proverbs is in chapter 23 and verse 17, and that's where I want to, to bring the lesson to tonight. Let your heart, I'm sorry, let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. There is a mindset that looks at life differently than this world, that understands there are things that are higher and longer lasting than this life. Well, how did, did, did Paul put it in, in the 2 Corinthians 4? He said, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. I think in, in, when he wrote Ephesians, that, that's really the heart of that great expression, the heavenly places. If you really understood things from God's perspective and vantage point, you'd see everything different. And I think that's the point made in the Proverbs as well. That if you trust God and you're patient to wait for the Lord, it'll make all the difference in your life. We hope to talk more about that when we talk about Ecclesiastes at the end of the week. So, how do you spot a fool? You can tell a fool from a wise man by how he speaks. You can tell a fool from a wise man by how he handles his money, <laughs> by how he controls or doesn't control his temper, by how he deals with his family or her family. And you can tell a wise man from a fool by whether or not he has a spiritual, a long-term eternal view or a carnal view. Now, where do we stand tonight in light of the Proverbs as we hold it up as a mirror before our eyes. I think, for me at least, I've got work to do. 
I appreciate your kind attention tonight. If you haven't already, please, uh, you can get your songbooks out or not. You know, I'm, I'm at these places now where uh, those expressions don't, don't hold the same anymore. My wife fusses at me sometimes. We go to places where they have the, the uh, songs on the charts. She'll say, they don't get the songbooks out here. But we're about to sing in a moment. And when we do, uh, I do hope we'll think carefully and thoughtfully about where we stand. And if we understand there are things that separate us from God, that we'll make today the day that we're going to try to work to get that right, to ask God's forgiveness and God's help, and let the proverb lead us and direct us, and I hope that, that all of us will be made better by looking at this great book. If you're here and you've never started the spiritual journey, you're not even in Christ. You need forgiveness of sins, and that comes on the basis of confessing Jesus as the Lord. That faith and that confession will lead us to be baptized for the remission of sins and to rise up to walk a new life, a new creature. If we can assist you in any way, let us know how. Please, right now, while we do stand, while we sing.